for me, the best thing that you could say about my work is that it's visually confusing. Like I want people to dive in and have no real stopping point. They just get taken on a visual journey. Hey everybody, this is Whitney Rosenson, owner of Art Dimensions, and welcome back to my podcast, Beyond the Palette. I'm really excited to be interviewing Ray Beldner today, a fantastic sculptor and mixed media artist whose work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally. Ray's work can be found in many public and private collections. He's based in San Francisco, where he received a BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute and an MFA from Mills College. So Ray is a brand new artist for Art Dimensions, therefore I cannot wait to get to know him better. Hi, Ray. Hi, hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Welcome to Beyond the Palette. Thank you, it's good to be here. Well, it's nice to have you and thank you so much for guesting today and for welcoming all of us into your creative world. Let's dive in. Did you always want to be an artist? Oh, Yes, because it seemed like one of those careers where I didn't have to get up very early in the morning and I could go to bed late at night. It seemed like a good deal. <laughs> so you made that decision when you were a teenager? No, actually, I, I started drawing when I was like in grade school. I just loved to draw. And I always tell this story. It's kind of a stupid story. But, you know, people's origin stories about art, I find are really interesting. Mine was I had a friend who could draw spunky. And Spunky is this mule that you used to see on a matchbook cover. And if you could draw him and send it in and it was good enough, you'd get like art lessons. So my friend could draw Spunky and I was jealous. So I started drawing Spunky. But then I just drew and drew and drew and drew. And this is like in fifth and sixth grade. And, and I realized pretty quickly by middle school, this is what I was going to do. Fabulous. All right. Let's talk about what you're up to today or these days in your studio. Yeah. Well. Um, there's a whole lot going on in there. A lot of paper happening. I saw that you or heard that you introduced me as a sculptor, and that is true. I identify as a sculptor, but as my friends like to point out to me, I haven't made anything three-dimensional in years, <laughs> except recently. Those collage rocks now are three-dimensional, but prior to that, I have been, you know, doing digital projects, uh, stitched kind of piece things out of money and a lot of those things are two-dimensional but I do feel like I'm a materials person and and because of that I think three-dimensionally um, and so lately what I've been doing is doing collage and a lot of it is based on um, historic and contemporary works of art I'll take those images scan them blow them up print them on a big Epson printer and then cut them up reassemble them I like to call it a kind of a, um, a milkshake of art historical references and imagery. Those pieces are so cool. And I just want to read, I, I'm a, this is from the, that series. You said, my process is intuitive and focuses on the visual tension between negative positive space, figuration abstraction, and how 2D forms occupy, define, and create space. Yeah. A lot of that goes back to my interest in art history and artists of the Renaissance who were interested in creating flat but dimensional realistic space. And so because I'm drawing from their work, their imagery, bits of their imagery, I'm also looking at their compositions and how they did in a realistic way create space. And I'm trying to do something similar with more abstract means. Yeah. And because I'm using like a lot of like Henry Moore and Jean Arp forms in my work, which were derived from the figure, I'm also looking at that tension between abstract organic shapes and figures and trying to, like they did, trying to ride a line between the two. For me, the best thing that you could say about my work is that it's visually confusing. Like I want people to dive in and have no real stopping point they just get taken on a visual journey yeah I mean I know I felt that way when I was as I've been looking at your works on paper so let's talk about a few of the different series that you have 
you've got your works on paper, your assemblages and your sculptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are those the three main bodies of work? Yeah, right now that's what's kind of going on. And uh, all of this work can be traced back to these little tiny eight by 10 collages I was doing like maybe seven, eight years ago. And I had had a kind of a fallow period in my career because I'd been going through a lot of personal stuff and I stopped making work for a few years. And when I wanted to get back into the studio, I didn't, you know, my work was more conceptually based back in the day. And um, I didn't feel like I had any real ideas that I wanted to explore. So I just uh, did what I would tell my art students to do if they didn't know what to do is take a magazine and cut it up and, and play with the images. And that's what I started doing. So I was making these little eight by 10 collages and I was cutting up what I had at hand, which was art history books and magazines, auction catalogs. And because I'm always looking at art historical references anyway. Um, and from that, the, the work got bigger. And then I started to see the possibilities of taking some of the two dimensional shapes and making them slightly three dimensional by cutting them out of wood, laser cut, plywood and then stacking them so they became more dimensional assemblages. I also, you know, I just don't like rectangles. So I had to break out of what I call the tyranny of the rectangle by making these shaped assemblages um, with no defined edges. Yeah, I was gonna say they're kind of amorphous. Yeah, they're really amorphous. And then they, they also have a, a lot going on on the surface, but there's also a lot of negative space that that I'm playing with um, by stacking them in certain ways and allowing a lot of voids to appear between the pieces. And then from that, because I loved just the individual shapes and because I recently moved my studio or I, I got a second studio up in the gold country in the Sierra foothills, I, um, I started looking outside of my studio towards the organic forms that I would see in nature, uh, mostly the rocks, because you know we're in gold country, it's super rocky terrain. So I started to make objects that were uh, more three-dimensional, that were based on rock forms. So taking the same material and shaping it into something that looks like a rock. It's not a rock, but it looks like a rock. So I just wanna mention all of this amazing artwork you could see at raybeldner.com. It's R-A-Y-B-E-L-D-N-E-R.com. And uh, I've got some of the works on paper on artdimensionsonline.com. So you can check them out there too. All right, what inspires you to create? I mean, we've sort of touched on that, but. Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, art history, other artists inspire me to create. And I feel like there's really nothing new under the sun. What we're all doing as artists is we're borrowing different ideas and shapes and images from other people, and then we're reconfiguring them into new forms. And that's, that's truly the definition of collage, but that's the definition of every artwork. It doesn't matter if you're a painter or a sculptor or a collage artist or a conceptual artist, you're building off of something. And so, you know, art and artist inspire me. And now, because I live, you know, in the upcountry, as they say, organic, kind of rough organic geometric forms are also becoming a real inspiration for me. Very cool. Very cool. All right. I'm curious about this. I think the listeners will be too, but I'm so curious about the art fairs that you, or the startup art fair that you created. And yeah. can we talk about that for a minute? Sure. Is, is that yeah. still going on? Well, it's interesting. Um, so, so what you're referring to is, is a, an art fair for independent artists that I started about, wow, seven years ago now, 2015. And what I was looking for as an artist myself was a way to put my work out in front of an audience directly without a, without a gallery intermediary. And if you want to do art fairs, typically you have to be with a gallery. Most art fairs are for galleries, not individual artists. So I came up with an idea to do a hotel art fair. And uh, my original partner was Steve Zavatero, who used to own a gallery in San Francisco. And we made it a juried fair. So every, every iteration had a different set of jurors that were curators and art dealers and, and working artists. Um, artists would take a room and create 
a solo exhibition in each room. We'd buy out the hotel for the weekend. And uh, usually 50, 60 rooms of art. And this, this was at which hotel? It was in Venice, right? So in, in San Francisco, we did it at a hotel called Hotel del Sol. In LA, we did it in a hotel called the Kinney Venice Beach, where I am actually today. This I was going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> because I, um, I love these guys and I love where it is. I like Venice. I like the West Side in LA. Um, and we did it for five years in both cities until COVID hit. And, um, and when COVID hit, we kind of um, went into hibernation like a lot of people. And we pivoted a little bit to online sales. And now that the world's opening back up again, we've decided to not do the events anymore. And so Startup is now becoming like an art consultancy and a gallery without walls. So we do pop-up shows, curated pop-up shows, Very mostly cool. from our alumni artists from the past fairs. And I've, I've worked with over 500 artists over these you know, last seven years. Wow. So um, I have a show right now that we did up in Sutter Creek in the gold country. I curate uh, rotating exhibitions for a hotel in San Francisco called Yotel San Francisco. And um, I'm hoping to do something with the Kinney that's along similar lines, doing some rotating exhibitions in their public spaces. But that's kind of what we're becoming. And that also allows me as, an, as a working artist to do more of my own work because the fairs were all consuming. I would spend five, six months just getting ready for one fair. So, and we had a team of people and we were constantly doing fairs. After one fair ended, we do the next one. Just because we did them in four cities. We did them in Houston, Chicago, LA, and San Francisco. Wow. I didn't realize it was in San Francisco and Houston. And yeah. What was the third one? Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, well, now you get more time in your studio, hopefully. I get more time in my studio, and yet at the same time, I get to be connected to all those wonderful artists that I used to work with at the fair, but just in different ways now. But I learned a lot from the artist working with them, um, just professional things. And I've also realized that, you know, there's a lot of ways I can help artists besides creating giant events. Okay. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do now. Okay, I want to piggyback on what you just said. Do you have any advice for emerging artists who might be listening to this podcast? Um, <laughs> I was going to say something really snarky, like get a job, get a trade. No. Um, That's okay too. Yeah. So here's the advice. This is the only advice I can give you is that you just have to make a lot of art and work hard. You can't take your foot off the pedal. Basically, if you want to be a successful artist, there's no cruising. There is no, waiting around to be discovered. There is no making art one day a week. You have to do it as much as you can on a consistent basis. And you have to put it out there in any way possible. It doesn't matter if it's online in your local coffee shop, um, you know, you do a pop-up or an open studios. The work has to get out there. We make art for people to um, enjoy it and to interact with it. And if you just make it and keep it in your garage, then I would question whether you're an actual artist. That is such great advice, Ray. Describe your aesthetic in three words. Playful, active, colorful. Awesome. <laughs> Playful, active, and colorful. At least that's what I, you know, aspire to with my work. Well, your work, tell, oh, I, well, your work in the, um, in the show that's up right now in LA is certainly playful, active, and colorful. Tell us about that so people here can yeah. go check it out. So I'm in a show called Future Patchwork. It actually opens today, June 9th. It's open from 3 to 7 p.m. No, July 9th. Oh, sorry, July 9th. Thank you. Yes, I'm a month behind. Opening today, um, it's at Walter Maciel Gallery in Culver City, and it'll be up until August 17th. Um, it's a group show, but I have a giant 20 foot by 15 foot tall wall where I've taken all of my collage rocks and I have put them on the wall. Since they're lightweight, they can actually, they can sit on the ground or pedestals, but I've actually uh, attached them to the wall. So I have a giant rock wall installation and it's very colorful and the shapes are really all unique and different. And it's, uh, and I think it's fun too. Oh, good. Okay. So I hope everyone who's listened to this will go check it out. 
The gallery name again is Walter Maciel. Walter Maciel. Yeah. Walter Maciel Gallery in Culver City. All right. Um, I read something. I read you meant you mentioned something about COVID affecting your practice and your work becoming more colorful yeah. now that we're coming out of COVID. Yes. How did that play out for you? Well, I mean, the work has been coming, becoming more and more colorful. I mean, the body of work I did before this was I was sewing money together into representations of famous works of art. So it was all green and white and gray. <laughs> and just by the nature of, you know, using, uh, art as the collage material that became more and more colorful, but now I'm really amping up the color. And part of that is because I feel like we're in a very challenging political-ish uh, environment right now. And it's sad and depressing a lot of times um, and frustrating. And um, as an artist, I could react against that politically and make work that is strident and political and very didactic, which a lot of people are already doing, or I could make something that is an alternative to the kind of angst and malaise that everybody is feeling. And so I'm trying to move in that direction into colorful work that is um, uplifting. And, I, and not to bury my head in the sand or deny what's going on in the world, but to react in the opposite way from the frustration that I feel about what's happening in the world. Okay. And that's part of the, and, and, and moving to the country and, and looking at, you know, more organic natural forms have also informed that, that shift into a colorful palette. Aesthetic. Yeah. Palette. Okay. Well, that makes perfect sense. The money, the money series that you're mentioning is called counterfeit. And I know I looked at this on your website. I think it is so cool. You this is a series where you sew dollar bills. Do you use anything, a denomination higher than a dollar bill? I have used, um, you know, fives and twenties, depending on, you know, if there's a client that wanted to commission me to do something different. I used mostly ones. So these are all sewed. You sew them together. They're all sewn. Yeah. They're amazing. So I'm looking, you've got a Jasper John's uh, bullseye right? You've got Robert Indiana's Love. Mm -hmm. You've got Klaus I think Oldenburg. I redid pretty much everybody in the canon of 20th century art, modern and contemporary. And the idea behind that was, as an artist and an educator, I was always asked to talk about my work and other people's work, not about the historic value or the intrinsic value or the societal value of the artwork, but its economic value. People were always wondering, how much did that painting cost? Or did you see that painting at the museum? It was $3 million. And as an artist, that made me very frustrated and sad that we will only value things because they have a dollar figure attached to them rather than you know what their real intrinsic value is. So I thought, well, one way to get around that or to address it head on is to make uh, work out of money. So I took all the famous works of art and I redid them to the exact scale and dimensions, but they weren't even really collages. They were quilts. I sewed them together. So sort of melding high and low craft together. Right, right. And I called it counterfeit because the money was real, but the artwork was fake. <laughs> oh, that's why you need to. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to read this says money. This is what you wrote. Money is an icon, a myth, a metaphor, a collectible, a talisman, a commodity, a means to an end, and much more. Money is ubiquitous, yet we never seem to have enough. In our American dream, it is a common object of desire, and we care greatly about its worth, yet we rarely reflect on its true value. So that totally encapsulated what you were just saying. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. Well, I, 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 I love the um, art historian and art writer, Dave Hickey, who passed, since passed away. He wrote an essay once about how art and money are exactly the same thing. Neither has intrinsic value. When you buy a work of art, you're trading a piece of paper with an artist's signature on it for a piece of paper with a bureaucrat's signature on it. And the value we give it is, is sustained by our collective faith. And if you think about it, it's true. I mean, money only has value because we agree to that. And when we lose faith, it, it loses its value. And the same with art. Art has value to the point where we stop believing it does. And then it's, you know, 
then it goes down in value. Yeah. Or up. If you think of Beeple's NFT, I you know, know. Why, why is someone willing to spend $69 million on that? I have no idea, but they believed it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. Okay. We could get into NFTs, but I think yeah. that would take us down a whole different avenue. Yeah. If you were granted a million dollars for an art project, what would you do? Oh, whoa. I, I never have even thought of that. Well, there's some things I've been wanting to do for a long time in the public art realm that if I had a million dollars, I could easily do that. Um, and that would be to take some of the pieces I'm doing now and scale them up really big, like mural size, both either inside or outside of a building, or to take some of the rocks I'm making and scale them up to public art size, like 20 feet tall. I would love to do that. I would love to just take what I'm already working on and scale it to something that was more durable and fitting for the outside. Because I've always loved to have artwork outside of institutional settings. Um, I've done a lot of public art and it always pleases me to no end to stumble upon something really wonderful and magical and it's in a park or, you know, it's on a wall of an alley somewhere outside of the white box. The norm. Yeah. Can you think of anywhere recently that you've stumbled upon something amazing? Well, I'm, you know, walking through Venice, I'm stumbling on all these great murals everywhere. I just ran into one next to a dry cleaner for the, you know, the artist Human? No. She's based out of the Bay Area, but she's super, she's kind of Instagram famous, but she's famous. And I ran into a mural of hers that I thought was really amazing. And it was right next to a laundromat, <laughs> you know? They're and all over. We were walking by a, a little shop uh, down by Venice Beach, uh, this place called uh, the Canal Market. And they had done a mural on the outside. It was just a pattern that looked almost like Native American baskets. And I know they weren't thinking about public art, but it was so beautiful and charming and visually very active. You know, it was, it was pattern on pattern. It was like my work. It was very visually confusing and wonderful all at the same time. And I just, we just stumbled on it just like a half an hour ago on our walk oh. back to breakfast. So but I cool. find stuff like that all the time. And I think that's where art is. Art is everywhere. Art is in the least expected places. And that's where it should be. It shouldn't all be locked up in Museums. giant buildings. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Okay, I want to wrap up with an easy question for you. These are just like quick spur, you know, off the cuff okay. questions. What is your favorite season? Oh, wow. I really like the fall because I like the changing of the weather and that kind of last bit of light that you get before it gets dark and gloomy in the winter. In winter. Yeah. Okay. Favorite food. Oh my God. Everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I won't eat. I mean, yeah. But okay. Favorite. Do you listen to music when you are working in your studio? I listen to music or I listen to podcasts. Yes, I do listen, but I do listen to a lot of music. Okay, so favorite music to listen to? Well, currently what I've been listening to, it's super random on Spotify, are like bluegrass covers of famous 80s and 90s pop songs. Oh, that sounds kind of interesting. It's a trip. <laughs> but I do love covers. I love a good cover. Okay, me yeah. too. Cover bands are fun. Ray, this was so inspiring and fun. Thank you so much for guesting on Beyond the Palette today. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. I highly recommend everybody check out Ray's incredible pieces on the Art Dimensions site, which is artdimensionsonline.com. Again, his site, raybeldner.com. Also, feel free to follow us on Instagram. And our handles are at Art Dimensions and at Ray Beldner. So that concludes our interview. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And to Ray and all of you, have a productive and happy week and happy creating.